Coming up on this episode of Crime Family. There was concerns that there was a serial killer on the loose in the area around the same time that you went missing. Just curious to know why he would turn, like, why he would say, oh, that's me in the sketch. Like, if that was me, I'd be like, hell no, that's not me. There's a serial killer on the loose, and they know he's operating in that area, and then you have a missing woman. Like, wouldn't you be just looking... It's kind of just like they were going through the motions of we looked for her but couldn't find her. When really, if they would have put any effort, they would have found her. So it does just kind of seem like they were just making it look like they were trying. It's obviously worse when a police officer has to come to your house and say that your daughter has been found dead. But for you to find them yourself is probably more heartbreaking than anything I could ever imagine. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Crime Family. I'm your co-host AJ, and I'm here with my two sisters, Stephanie and Katie. And this week, Steph is going to be telling us all about a case that she's been looking into. This is one that I actually suggested for you, Steph. I thought it might be an interesting one for you to look into. Um, it happened here in Toronto, and I know quite a quite a bit about it, but thought it would be interesting for the podcast. So you can go into the case and let us know all about this one. What case is it, first? The case I'll be doing is the Tess Ritchie case. I had never heard about this case until AJ suggested it for me. And once I started doing some research, it's quite an interesting case. There's quite a bit to unload in this case, so I'm just going to dive right in. So, Tess Ritchie was born in North Bay, Ontario, and she was the youngest of five. She moved to Toronto when she was just 19. According to her sister, Rachel, who was eight years older than Tess, Tess loved life, she loved her dogs, and she loved her family. And her family, they were pretty close, knit family. Tess was also a kind-hearted and spirited person who wanted nothing but happiness in her life. When Tess moved to Toronto, she was a server, but her dream was to become a flight attendant. Tess wanted to travel the world, and she was taking a flight attendant course at Seneca College in Toronto. And her life was going pretty well. Like I said, she had like a pretty good job and she was going to college and she was young and wanted that independent life. But unfortunately, her and her boyfriend had broke up in the fall of 2017, around November 23rd. And Tess was really devastated. Her sister Rachel was there to support her. And Rachel and Tess were very, very close. They were soulmates, according to Rachel. The day after her breakup, Tess and Rachel spent the whole day together. They talked about the breakup. They went shopping. And because Tess loved her dog, they went to a dog park. That evening, Rachel had made dinner and had to coax Tess into eating because Tess was still pretty upset about her breakup. And even though Tess was shaken up about her breakup, she was still making plans to go out that night with a friend that she knew from high school who just had moved to the same neighborhood and her name was Riley and suggested they go to this well-known drag bar called Cruise and Tangos. So Rachel's husband ordered an Uber for Tess so she could meet up with her friend downtown. But little did she know that this would be the last time she would see her sister. Tess arrived at the bar at around midnight and it was a very packed bar. Tess texted her sister to let her know that she had arrived safely And Rachel mentioned that Tess's phone was like her second friend. She never went anywhere without it. And she said even her ringtone was the theme song for the show American Horror Story. Kind of ironic as we get into this case a little bit more. 
Tess's friend Riley showed up shortly after, and the two had danced the night away and drank a lot. And because Tess was a small girl, she was a very lightweight and unsteady on her feet, so it didn't take her long to get drunk. In one of the security cameras that were at the club, you could see Tess and Riley heading to the dance floor. In this video, you can see a man following Tess and Riley to the dance floor, and this man was Kalen Schlater, who was a 21-year-old male, and he was known as a lady man, a ladies man. In the second clip, you can see him dancing with another guy right next to Tess and her friend. These videotapes are a key component to the this case, as you'll hear later on in the case. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background ab about Kalen. Kalen was, like I said, was 21, and he was seen as a ladies man, and he lived with his parents and his younger brother in Toronto. And after he graduated from high school, he went on to study mechanics at a post-secondary college. He was also into video games and sandstone carvings and board games and card games. So he seemed like a good person, not a violent person, and after, and just like a person that kept to himself and like a well-educated human being. According to some footage of the bar, Kaylin had arrived 15 minutes before Tess did at Cruise and Tango's, and he arrived after he was drinking at a friend's house, so he was pretty drunk when he got to Cruise and Tango's. And there's also footage of Riley and Tess together upstairs and downstairs and outside by the front door, but it did not show that Tess and Kaylin had any interactions while inside the club. As the night goes on, they're dancing and having a good time. At around 2.15 in the morning, Tess and Riley were asked to leave the club because they were very intoxicated. And you can see Tess arguing with the bouncer. The bar was about to close anyways, and Tess and Riley were having a smoke outside while the crowd was exiting the club. At this time, Kaylin was also exiting the club. Kaylin was known to wait outside and lurk in the crowd for groups of girls and would strike up conversations to find someone to sleep with. So about five minutes after the girls were asked to leave the club, they are seen walking down Church Street heading northbound, but they disappear out of the camera view. As they continue to walk, you can see in the video camera that Kaylin looks in their direction, and after he finishes the conversation, he heads in the same direction as Tess and Riley. And at this point, Tess is wanting to go home, so she tries to flag down a cab. And at this point, Kaylin had caught up to Tess and, and Riley and had struck up a conversation with them. So when Tess flags down a cab, Kaylin kind of convinced them to keep walking and they're gonna, they want to go find something to eat. So Tess just waves off the cab and they're heading down Wellesley to get a hot dog. And this footage, you can see them walking down towards a hot dog stand. And as they're walking, a witness named Michelle Teep, who lived two doors down from the intersection of Church Street, said she heard some commotion at around 3 a.m. on November 25th, the same night as Tess and Kaylin and Riley were out. She then looks over and said she saw Tess, Kaylin, and Riley walking down the street. She says she hears them laughing and it seems like they were running from something. And she was actually right because Riley had just sprayed mustard all over the hot dog cart. She could see the hot dog vendor and the damage that Riley did. Teep then says that Tess said sorry to her for making too much noise. But Michelle Teep said it was okay in that. So they started to sit down and have a conversation. Michelle noticed that they were pretty intoxicated. So Tess and Riley introduced themselves but she said that Kalen just stood there and only said hi in a shy voice and that he didn't really talk to Michelle that much. The conversation lasted about 20 minutes and at this point Riley had told Tess that she wanted to leave and this kind of made Tess upset because Tess wasn't ready to go home and according to Michelle Kalen said quote I've got this it will be okay. There are some videos showing that Riley's walking westbound on Dundonald Street away from the direction of Tess and Kaylin, so she's leaving to go home. And I guess it was an argument. Riley wanted to go home at this point, but Tess didn't want to. But 
Riley just left anyways. And this was around 4 a.m. And so at this point, Tess also decides that, well, since Riley's leaving, I would like to leave too. So she flakes down a taxi again, but Kaylin waves off the taxi because it was holding up traffic. So I guess it was really busy where they were and for them to get into a cab, it just, I guess, was holding up traffic. Tess and Kaylin walked a little bit more and then Tess seemed to be still quite a bit upset about the argument she had with Riley before she left. And it was at this point around 4.02 that Tess calls an Uber. And the Uber showed up at 4.15, but Tess did not. And the next video shows Tess and Kaylin walking hand in hand towards a small stairwell. And you see them both going into the stairwell. You can see in the video that Kaylin walks back up the stairs, but Tess doesn't come up the stairs with him. And this was the last time anyone has seen Tess alive. So before I go any further, do you guys have any comments or? When I was doing this research for this case, I was amazed about all the video footage that was out there. Cause you could see Kaylin and Tess pretty much throughout the night leading up to, to the horrible incident that I'm about to tell you about. What was the stairwell leading to? Was it a house? Was it apartment? Could it have been a building that she went into and went out like a back door or something? It was a house that was on, under renovations. There was like a concrete stairwell that like at the bottom there was like a door that I'm assuming was just locked. So maybe it like led to a basement of some type in this building. Oh, so she couldn't have gone in and gone out a different door? No. Okay. Yeah, because in the video, if you look closely, you can just see... Like, it shows the house, and then it shows the stairwell. And you can kind of see, like, it just kind of ends at the bottom of the stairwell. And there's just... Yeah, that gauge that there's a door there, but I'm assuming it didn't open. I'm wondering what the purpose would be for them to go to that little stairwell that didn't lead to anything. You know what I mean? Like, what were they thinking of going to this little stairwell? I'd be curious to know. I think also important to to know that all this is like surveillance footage, which was just recovered after the fact, like in the course of the investigation into the case. So these were just surveillance footage that it must have just been captured from, you know, businesses or whatever, right? Like all the surveillance footage, because they were downtown, like this bar they're at is like a big populated like busy downtown area so all of the stores would have surveillance footage so this is kind of the trail that they were able to piece together or the story they were able to piece together based on the witness michelle teep that they kind of came across after leaving the bar and then all of these little different surveillance footage along their route so that's kind of how they sort of pieced it together but that was sort of after the fact um during the course of the investigation obviously because no one it's like it's like four in the morning no one's at the store seeing this for themselves at the time so this is all stuff that came out later one of my biggest things when I was researching this case and reading about Tess was that like I couldn't imagine just her friend just leaving her there with this guy that they just met at the bar I mean a lot of like I mean I know a lot of people do that and nothing ever happens to them but like I just to me for her just to leave when they went together they could have went home together speaking from my own experience we've gone to the bar with like a group of friends and one of them breaks off because they meet somebody that happens almost every time it, well it used to happen I mean and so it's I don't think it's that strange or uncommon for her to just leave her with some guy that she met because it happens all the time and it's happened to you know people that I've been with so and especially at that age you just don't think of the dangers you're just, and especially when you're drunk you're just thinking have a good time you know see you later kind of thing yeah i mean it's kind of expected like if you go with a group not everyone's gonna leave as a group kind of at least when you're what she was 19 or whatever like yeah like katie said at that young age it's especially true i feel yeah and i I mean Steph, you know when we would go down there'd be this one specific friend that would come with us and wouldn't even meet somebody but would just kind of leave on his own and kind of run to mcdonald's yeah. and then run home yeah, <laughs> yeah. every time and yeah. it was just like expected okay he's gone we know where he is and you know so that kind of thing just goes through your mind it's kind of like oh i met who they're going with or i know what they're going to do and you just expect that it's going to be fine aj she wasn't 19 when she went missing oh she was 22 she was young yeah she was still young still in like her early partying years i feel yeah early 20s (laughs) 
So the next morning, Tess's sister, Rachel, texts Tess, but she doesn't expect an answer right away because she knew that Tess was out all night and she's probably hungover and that she's probably just sleeping. But when she didn't hear from her after 6 p.m., that's when she started to get worried. Rachel says that it wasn't normal for Tess not to answer her phone because she was always in contact with her sisters and other family members. And when they didn't find her at her apartment, that's when panic set in. And when the police were called for like a missing persons report, and when the police turned up nothing after their search, that's when Tess's mom and one of her other sisters had decided to travel to North Bay and search themselves because to them, the police weren't really doing anything and they were searching, but they couldn't find her. Tess's case only started to get widespread attention after Rachel, Tess's sister, traveled across the province to search for her. And it was then that people really started to know that she was missing. You see, after Tess's mother came down and searched for her daughter, after putting flyers up all around Toronto, it was actually Tess's mother and our family friend that had found Tess in the stairwell just 40 meters away from where she was last seen. Of course, this put a lot of people in in a frenzy because at the time, the police were quickly criticized for their failure in finding Tess. And it was in the in the weird part of this whole searching for Tess was that like the police were in the same location just three days earlier, and they didn't find her body. Like they didn't see her body or whatever. So I'm not sure. Like, obviously, their searching tactics weren't up to speed. Well, yeah, it's so like it was so weird because I remember, like, obviously, I lived here at the time, and I think it was like pretty, like, it was kind of all over the news, or people were aware that she was missing for however long. She wasn't missing that long, really, right before her mother found her. Like, it was kind of a short, wasn't a super long time, but anyway, that was that was the whole kind of the thing about the case was that it was ended up being her mother that found her, but supposedly the police had checked in this area but obviously they didn't check very hard like she's at the bottom of the stairwell yes but you know you just kind of walk a few feet off the sidewalk and peer down that stairwell you'll see her i mean her mother was able to find her and she's not a trained searcher so i mean the police who are trained and looking in that area couldn't have looked very hard obviously but their whole thing was like well they they searched and didn't find her so do they know that she had been there the whole time? Could it have been a coincidence that that's where she was last seen, but maybe she left and then, then the police did search, but then she happened to end up there again? Do they know that that wasn't the case? Well, I mean, I guess at the at the time, they didn't... I mean, Steph will go into it a little bit more, but I, I, I feel like at the time, I don't think that was in their minds, or maybe it was, but I think the, the kind of the narrative was that the police are just incompetent and just didn't search hard enough. Because, like I said, the surveillance footage and stuff came out after. So she was found in the stairwell, and then it was the surveillance footage found later that showed them going into the stairwell. So I think people kind of just assumed that she had been there the whole time. So I don't really know if... Well, yeah, I guess if they saw footage and they just never saw her coming out of the stairwell, and then she's found in the stairwell, she obviously hadn't left and come back. So I guess that answers that. Is this kind of like an example of the police just thinking that she's a 21-year-old girl? She was out drinking, partying... She went on a bender or met somebody and she's just with them. So they weren't really thinking it was that serious. Is that kind of what they were thinking as well, maybe? Yeah, it was kind of speculated that like the police, like what you said, they were thinking like, yeah, she was just out partying that she's probably just at somebody's house sleeping it off and just hasn't contacted anyone yet. But obviously that wasn't the case when her mother found her in the bottom of the stairwell. And I couldn't imagine like having... To find your own daughter. It's obviously worse when a police officer has to come to your house and say that your daughter has been found dead. But for you to find them yourself is probably more heartbreaking than anything I could ever imagine. I think it's a fine line too because like you said the police could just assume that she's oh she's a 22 year old she's just partying she'll be back. So it's a kind of a fine line of like you can't put all these police resources into looking into every single person who doesn't answer their texts within 12 hours of last being seen like because most of those people will turn up or you know even if it's a couple of days you know they just say well they always turn up or you know it ends up being nothing so you have to kind of walk that line of 
you can't investigate every little thing, but then also you can't not look into every little thing. But it, and it's only a, a kind of retrospect now that you know, since we know what happened in this case, or we'll know what happened. That obviously they should have been more intri- put more effort into it. But I guess at the time, I don't know. They were just calculate, or you know, you take the, I don't know, you know what I mean. Like they were kind of just kind of. How do you know that this one is any different until you know that it was different? Yeah, I guess. When you think about it, I guess nine times out of ten, it does turn up that the person was just sleeping it off or didn't want to answer their phone for whatever reason. But I think the fact that the police were in the area and didn't see the body or didn't, you know, didn't care to look hard enough, and then her mother had to come and kind of do that job for them, is, I think, super heartbreaking. Yeah. They're putting on this act as if that they were really caring and that they did everything right, when, like, obviously they weren't a- if her mother was able to come and retrace her steps, like she's an amateur, like detective or not even a detective, right? Like she's just logically following the steps that she knows that, you know, from the bar that she was last at and she's able to find her relatively quickly. So if she's able to do that and like these trained police officers aren't able, even able to, then obviously they put no effort in at all. It's kind of just like they were going through the motions of we looked for her but couldn't find her when really if they would have put any effort they would have found her so it does just kind of seem like they were just making it look like they were trying so those police officers who were criticized for failing to find tests were eventually charged with misconduct for neglect of duty under the police service act so they did get charged for not canvassing the neighborhood thoroughly and doing their job properly and Going back to when Tess's mom found her, um, she knew it was her daughter right away. Just, well, I mean, she was obviously the mother and she she should know your children. But she describes that she knew it was Tess's body laying at the bottom of the stairs because Tess had this black sweater on with high heels and fishnet stockings and her purple purse was next to her as well as her pink polka dot phone. That she never, like her phone was one thing that she never left home without. And she was also covered in soot from a pile of gra- gravel that was next to her body. So the body was just like laying there for, I guess, if you weren't, if you're just walking by, you might not have seen her, seen the body. But I mean, yeah. And I'm thinking because this is November, right? In Toronto, it was probably very cold. So it, probably would have preserved the body more than if it was in the middle of summer where you probably would have been able to smell it or there would have been like flies around it faster than November so that probably you know helped with the concealing of it I think Mm -hmm. so after uh, those police were charged with misconduct the police department put a team together to create a missing persons unit when this team was created it didn't take long for the investigation to start murder investigation to start and at this time the only suspect that they had was Kaylin Schlater because he was the last person to see her alive and you can see in the in the footage that they both go into the stairwell and he's the only one that comes out at this time the police believed that he sexually assaulted her and then strangled her so the sexual assault and the strangulation was just Speculation because at that time there was no autopsy done on Tess yet, so they were just trying to piece together what could have happened to Tess. So, because Kaylin was one of those people who liked to go out quite often to pick up girls and go to clubs and stuff, according to an article that I read, Kaylin at one point had told an undercover cop that he liked going to gay bars to find people to have sex with. And that he knew that women also go there as well. And according to some video footage, you can see Kaylin, like I said earlier, arriving at the cruise and tangos. At this point, they're looking for the last person to see Tess alive. And they put out a sketch of this person that they believe was the last person to see Tess. And Kaylin had called in to say like, Yes, that was him in the sketch. I mean, I feel like, I don't know why he would, like, oh yeah, that's me. Anyways, but that's what, according to the article that I read, he was the one who called in to say, yeah, that was me in the sketch. 
Wait, did they think it was him before and he was just confirming? Or did he step up out of nowhere and was like, that's me? Well, the video footage of him coming out of the stairwell, they didn't have his name, but they knew, like, they had, like, what he looked like. So, so they found the the surveillance footage and then they put made a sketch based on that surveillance footage. Oh, okay. And then he came forward and was like, that's me. Yeah. Okay. So on December 10th, during a press conference, they showed some video footage of a man last seen with Tess. And then around 9 that night, Kalen calls 911 and says that he is the man in those images. And, and then the officers then went to his house and placed him under investigation detention. So not... I guess, arrest, but not arrest, I guess. So the police wanted to do an undercover operation on Kalen, and they wanted to watch him over the course of several weeks, but they were concerned for the public safety. I guess after he was taken into custody, he was let go, I guess, and they wanted to do an operation on him, but they were concerned for the public safety because of the violence of the crime. They just ended up arresting him on February 4th, 2018 and he was placed in his holding cell at 3.15 a.m. And his parents, because he lived with his parents, went down to the jail cell and gave him like food and drink, like drinks to like calm him down. I mean, it seems awfully... <laughs> Wait, you're allowed to do that? Give people food when they're in jail? That's what it said in the article I was reading. I'm like, what? Yeah, they gave him food and drinks. Because at the time, like, he was arrested and charged, but there was no, like, a, he wasn't sentenced to anything, like. Oh, yeah, maybe you're allowed to do that just in, like, the holding cells and, like, not actual prison, just jail. Okay. Once he was in the holding cell, the autopsy was complete and it revealed that Tess died from neck compressions. So this showed that, obviously, she was strangled. And that's when he was charged with second-degree murder. And at the time of his arrest, he also had no uh, police record. And when information comes out that Slater was arrested, it was then that the Global News also released information that Kaylin Slater had witnessed an attempted murder back in August of 2017, when a man attacked his neighbor with a hammer. And Kaylin claims he had tried to intervene and help the injured person. So it kind of goes show that he was in a similar situation prior to Tess's murder. But this all came out after he was arrested, like all of this information. Except he was helping in that scenario. Yes. He was helping. Yeah, and not helping in this scenario. Yeah. Was he actually helping though? Well, well that's what he says, I guess. Yeah, that was, that was according like, to a Global Mail article that they did an interview yeah. with. But I mean, that's like he witnessed it. So that's just him. Like, that's kind of hearsay. Like, I don't think there was actually any investigation into that. Well, did that person die that he was helping? It didn't say. He just said he was injured. So the investigators who were working on Tess's case believed that Kaylin and Tess first met on the night she was killed and that her death was a crime of opportunity And so on March 21st, the charges were upgraded from second-degree murder to first-degree murder after new evidence was found. The trial was supposed to last about six weeks, but there was concern at the time because of the COVID pandemic. And at the time, all, all the Ontario court proceedings were adjourned for months, but Justice Michael Dambort offered the people who were proceeding in the case if they wanted to continue or wait for a later date, but they all chose to continue. So on March 23rd, 2020, Schlater was found guilty of first-degree murder. And that's how it ends. But he was found guilty on March 23rd. But when Tess first went missing, this all came out after he was found guilty, but when Tess was first went missing... There was concerns that there was a serial killer on the loose in the area around the same time that she went missing. And that serial killer was known as today as Bruce MacArthur. So he was known to frequent that area of where Tess was 
murdered because that's the that's where the, the gay bar was that she went to and we all know who Bruce MacArthur is, right? Yeah, Bruce MacArthur killed gay men though, didn't he? Yeah. Yes. After she went missing, I guess there was concerns that there was a serial killer on the loose in that area at the same time, but they didn't know it was Bruce MacArthur until like a little bit later. Well, because like there had been like the long investigation because there had been a series of gay men who were found murdered or missing, who were missing from that area of the city. And then I guess that they were maybe mm-hmm. zeroing in on Bruce MacArthur at that time because that was in November of 2017. And then Bruce was arrested in January of 2018, which would have been only like a month or two months after Tess died. So that was kind of happening at the same time as the Bruce MacArthur investigation. Um, and so, yeah, I guess maybe people thought, but I, I think, I think that kind of came into it because people thought that maybe their resources were just strapped because they were so focused on Bruce MacArthur that they didn't have the resources to focus on. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say, I think when they were looking for Tess at the time, they were preoccupied with the Bruce MacArthur case. They were trying to hone in on a serial killer and then they had this murder on top of that. So, I mean, yes, they did some shady search work locating her body, but I mean... Toronto police police of Toronto like they have a lot on the go probably every day so but that still doesn't excuse them for not searching for her the right way yeah I guess it kind of if you are thinking their mindset it's like we already have a serial killer and then there's this girl that was out partying and she's missing so and that kind of like we're saying before they're not that concerned because she's probably just out partying sleeping somewhere and they also have a serial killer that they're thinking about so that's I can definitely see why they weren't this was not a priority for them, even though, of course, like you said, that doesn't excuse their sh- shoddy police work. So you had mentioned earlier that more evidence had come out, and that's ultimately why Kaylin was convicted. So I'm just curious what other evidence was there. Yeah, so according to Kaylin during his trial, he said that he and Tess went down that stairwell to make out and that Kaylin wanted to have sex with Tess, but Tess said no because she was on her period that night. He then claims that he ejaculated on his pants and was a little bit embarrassed about it as he tells his story in the courtroom. And according to the forensic evidence, there was semen on the upper part of Tess's pants and saliva on her bra. Kalen then goes on to say that he invited Tess back to his parents' place and was telling her that he had a very cool family and that he really wanted her to meet his family. But Tess denied his offer and told him to to leave and she pulled out her phone and about 45 minutes later you can see Kaylin walk out of the stairwell but Tess did not so obviously there was some type of assault or disagreement because she didn't want to go back to his house or she didn't want to have sex with him or whatever the case may be so you can tell like it was a violent like he just was embarrassed or didn't like the fact that she was rejecting him didn't like rejection but obviously he got mad and very violent towards her so that's the evidence that came forward that and that's what he was his story of how why they went to the stairwell and then the forensic evidence came out like so dna evidence yeah it's like they had literally had him on video they're tracking his entire night plus the DNA evidence that they found on her body so those two things together it was like indisputable really yeah that's interesting I remember you said earlier that he was considered a ladies man or whatever so probably he wasn't used to rejection so maybe that was what kind of tipped him off there also I'm surprised that he wanted to take her back to his parents house like who wants to go meet some random dude's parents at four in the morning so yeah, definitely agree with her on that one. So yeah, that's just, it's super, it, it was almost like an open and shut case. Like there was evidence they saw him in the stairwell and she just never came out. And yeah. It's interesting too, because you said that he turned himself in to the police because saying he was the person in that sketch, or he didn't turn himself in, but he said that he was the pe- person in the sketch. But the only reason that they had those sketches was because they saw a person that matched that description in the surveillance footage 
So, I mean, they have the DNA evidence. So even without that surveillance footage, they would still have that DNA evidence, but they wouldn't have been able to necessarily tie it to... They still wouldn't have known who that DNA necessarily belonged to if he didn't have a record, you know, if he wasn't in the system. So that sketch from that footage along with the DNA evidence, really. And a lot of the, like, the video footages that were seen, like, throughout the night were kind of what opened and closed the case because you could see him with Tess and Riley the whole entire night. And then you have, like, the witness of Michelle Teep. So there was all kinds of people seeing Kalen with Tess and Riley. So it was kind of like he couldn't escape from the murder that he did because there was so much, like, physical evidence out there. Well, yeah, and also, what, normally when you th- there's this kind of thing, the for whatever reason, oh, the video cameras just happen to not be working in that location, or they could see them walking, but then, oh, the the camera that's pointed at the alley doesn't work. But in this case, they actually everything worked out. Well, it worked against him, but worked out for like justice for the family. So that's not something we see all the time. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And, like, I guess it wasn't even necessarily because I just looked at a picture. It wasn't even, like, an alley, really. It was, like, just... It's, like, a, just a house on along the side, along the street. But it was, like, kind of back. I don't know. It's, I guess it's hard to ex- explain. It wasn't really an alley, though, because maybe it's, like... The point being, it's, like, it's not necessarily... You wouldn't suspect there to be a random security camera on this house because it just looked like a house that maybe had a little bit of, like, construction work being done. So it's not like it was an alley that... So it's not necessarily a place that you would suspect to have a security camera on you, which is why maybe he didn't think that they would be evidence of that because he didn't think this random house would. Sorry, I'm just curious to know why he would turn like why he would say, oh, that's me in the sketch. Like if that was me, I'd be like, hell no, that's not me. Yeah, I'm wondering if he knew that they got that sketch because of the video footage or if the police were just like, this is who witnesses say that they saw with her because he may not have known that there's an actual camera in that alley in that stairway so maybe that's why he's just like oh to make it not look as bad because people saw him with her that tina woman so he's like yeah i'll admit it but also yeah i think without that footage because i mean even if his dna was on her that could still be kind of circumstantial and be like yeah well we did get together but then i left and there's no proof that he was the last one to see her without that footage. So I think like that was definitely the nail in his coffin for sure. Yeah, I'm going to send you actually a picture from what the house looked like or what the area looked like. Because I think it's easier to think about it when you see it, obviously. So like it wasn't like an alley, but like the stairwell was at that back, the part that's furthest back from the street, that little white part. Oh, like the black door, kind of? Yeah. Yeah, I'm assuming that that's the black door, but there's a stairwell going down from there. Oh, okay. Because like, it looks like there's a railing, right? Like, there's look like there's that railing. Mm-hmm. But then there's also a picture of that on that same that same side I got this from of what the stairwell looked like as well. Okay. So, yeah, I'd, from, I don't even know if you said it was an alley, but it kind of in my head pictured an alley. But this really is just a kind of a space between two houses. There really isn't a way out. I don't know. Like, if I was walking on the sidewalk there, like, I wouldn't think of there being a security camera right No. There, necessarily. Because it just looks like, yeah, just a space between two houses, which... But I think a, a lot of construction places, I mean, I know here in Halifax, they do have cameras just in case, like, some vandalism goes on or something happens or whatever during someone steals construction equipment. Like, I feel like a lot of places would have surveillance cameras on their construction sites right was this a construction site though or was it just an abandoned house because if it wasn't a construction site and just some random house you wouldn't yeah like aj was saying you wouldn't think there was a camera there yeah so like you're just thinking oh this is like a house because it doesn't even it doesn't really look like a construction site necessarily i mean yeah there's like some boards but i don't know yeah like that yeah that fence kind of it does kind of what they would put up i think for a construction site but it doesn't yeah, you, your first thought would not be that's a construction site. Yeah, I guess, like, when you see that first picture, if you were the police that were supposedly looking for her, you kind of would have to go right up to that stairwell and look down to see her. So if they just kind of were walking along the sidewalk and looking down, 
that little space, yeah, there's no way they would have seen her. You really had to, like, actually make an attempt to go down that way. Yeah. And I guess it also makes sense, too, how... Like, even before I saw this picture, I had it in my mind that it was actually closer to the street. Because I was like, how would someone not see it? But I guess you wouldn't really see the body at the bottom of the stairwell until you're, unless you go up to it, obviously. Because it's obviously not visible from the street. Because I was like, I thought it was closer to the sidewalk. And I was like, how is someone, no one, no one's seeing this? But if I'm, a, if I'm a police officer and I, like, obviously do my job well, like, I'm going to look at all the stairwells and all the... Well, yeah, you're not just going to walk by that area and be like, no, she's not there. You would, obviously, like her mother did, go down there and check. You wouldn't leave any space unturned because you never know. Because her mother, like, obviously had no reason to think that she was in that specific stairwell, but she was just searching thoroughly in the area, which is something the police could easily do. You don't have to necessarily have reason to believe that that's the stairwell she's in. You don't know she's in a stairwell, but you're just looking in the area. That's such a small, like, little space, and if you could tell... he if he's like standing in that stairwell she really couldn't get out because it's like that the walls on both sides it's like a really scary place for someone to go through that it's definitely not an easy spot to get out of if someone's definitely like blocking your way there's only one way out and he obviously kept her from going out so and it was november so it would have been cold so it probably would have been icy not that it would matter but she could have like tried to get away but slipped or something do you know what i mean I mean, it's kind of it's kind of like a weird case though, because like you said, it was open and shut because like unfortunately she was murdered, but then they like they found who did it so quickly because he kind of kind of turned himself in to be honest. This one, yeah, one interesting aspect is that he maybe didn't mean to. He was trying to maybe be cooperative by saying I was with her and that's me in the sketch, but not realizing that they actually had legit footage of them going in there together and her not coming out. And yeah, and I think the interesting but sad aspect that her mother had to be the one to find her definitely adds another layer of sadness to this case, I guess. Because like, like what would have happened if her mother wasn't able to make it to Toronto as soon as she did to find her? Like, would the police have found her at all? Or who, who else would have found her? Yeah, like how long would she have been there before somebody did find her? And then, yeah, by that time, maybe some of the DNA evidence wouldn't have been there if it was snow and stuff, right? Yeah, like you get a few snowstorms. Could have been like a construction crew could have found her. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't because it was like she was there for a few days. But That's true. Obviously they weren't working there for the few days. Yeah, it kind of makes it look like though because that fence, maybe they were inside that fenced area and maybe they wouldn't have even had to go down to that stairwell at all. So yeah, who knows? what the outcome would have been if her mother was, wasn't was as persistent as she was. Yes, parents of children or people go missing. Like, you want to be persistent. You want to know, like, where your family member is at and you want to try to find them. But, like, it's the police's job to find what happened to your family member. Not You're not supposed to find your daughter laying in the bottom of a stairwell. Like, that's not... Like, you can go search for your daughter, but you're not the one who's supposed to find them. But that's supposed to be the police job. But they did get charged with misconduct, so. I think they were just preoccupied, honestly, with everything else. With the Bruce MacArthur case, because that was basically, that was a huge investigation that took up most of their resources. So I don't think any case around that time got any of the attention it really deserved. And that was, like, it wasn't that around the same area, too, though? Like the same yeah well it was was in like the village it was like where all the gay bars are and stuff because that's where the victims of bruce MacArthur were were gay men from the village that went missing and then this just happened to take place in the same area of the city around the same time that there was all of that word of that investigation so people kind of lumped them in obviously she doesn't fit the mo she wasn't a, a gay man but i think i don't know it just kind of all happened to take place at the same time and that's why her mother would had to be the one to find her because the police just didn't give a shit, to be honest. They didn't have the resources, I guess, to have someone search her like properly. But that doesn't matter. Like you're a you're police, you have to find other ways to do your job. And if you if you can't do it yourself, like bring in other teams or bring other people in to help you. You can't just give up 
they had all of their resources strapped on the Bruce MacArthur case, but even that one they botched many, many times. So they're just incompetent. But I mean, there's a serial killer on the loose, and they know he's operating in that area, and then you have a missing woman. Like, wouldn't you be just looking because... You know, even though, like, she could be a victim of his, so why not just search your hardest because you just never know what you're going to find rather than being like, well, you know, she, nothing probably happened to her. Let's move yeah. on. Yeah, and that could help why you. Not it, just, yeah. Yeah. Like, and you never know. Like, sometimes serial killers do stray from their M.O., so you just never know. Maybe she was with somebody, one of his, you know, somebody that he wanted, and she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe she saw something that he did. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it's not that far-fetched to be like, oh, he, she could have been a victim. Let's search for her as if she was. Yeah. Or yeah. just even, you know, even if she wasn't, you know, still search for her properly. Exactly. And then there was also the body of a trans woman that was found around the same time as well that they were looking into as possibly was a victim of Bruce MacArthur too. So all of these things were happening around the same time. And the Bruce MacArthur case... But I don't even know. I think they were like, these could possibly be tied to it, but they didn't really put any attention into those other two. They just kind of focused all on the victims that were suspected, like the gay men that were suspected to be victims of Bruce MacArthur versus Tess. Yeah, and there was like speculation out there, like the police were speculating that maybe she was like an escort or like stuff, like just random stuff like that. Like maybe she, like, do you know I mean, maybe she was one of those escorts that her parents didn't know about? Oh yeah, maybe she put herself in that situation and it's not worthy of looking that hard for. Yeah. Because I think every 22-year-old who gets drunk it just happens to be out somewhere gallivanting with somebody else. Like, Well, yeah, because that's what probably usually is what happens, but that doesn't mean you have to assume that that's what happened every single time. And like, I try to, you know, I try to play devil's advocate or look at it from their perspective. It's like, we don't know the amount of missing person reports that they get in a day that end up being abs- like nothing. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, you don't hear about those ones because they're not, they don't turn into anything. But they probably get so many reports of a missing person. And then 24 hours later, they're found and it was, they weren't actually missing at all. It was just, they were mad at their mother or something, right? And they just didn't, you know? So I feel like, I don't know. I feel like they get that so many times that it's eventually they might just kind of be in that mindset of like, well, we're not going to be really concerned until we have an actual reason to be. And they just didn't have that in this case until they found her mother found her body. And I do feel bad for her friend Riley because like she did leave her alone with Kaylin, even though Tess told like they had an argument because she was leaving. Like if she would have just stayed like this whole case would never have happened. But I mean, you can't. You always wanted to say, like, what ifs. Yeah, I mean, obviously we can't put any blame on Riley, because there's no way, obviously, she would have known. And you never know, something could have happened to her as well if she would have stayed. We don't know how overpowering he could have been for even two women, right? So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so that's the Tess Ritchie case. And thank you so much for tuning in. And listening, if you are a fan of the podcast, you can follow us on all the social medias at Crime Family Podcast on Instagram, Crime Family Pod 1 on Twitter, Crime Family Podcast on Facebook, and we do have a new website, crimefamilypodcast.ca. Definitely check us out there where you can listen to full episodes, uh, see transcripts, and you can leave us a voicemail if you'd like. You might be able to hear your voice on the podcast in the future. Thank you so much for listening, and we will be back next week with another case for you guys. Thank you for the support and loving the podcast and listening and all your feedback. We appreciate it, all the messages we get. You can also send us your case suggestions at crimefamilypodcast at gmail.com. If you hear of a case or you see a case that you really want us to cover, you think it'd be interesting, just give us an email or you can fill out the contact form on our website and let us know your case suggestion there as well. And yeah, we love hearing your feedback and we're very happy you're enjoying the show and you're enjoying our third season. So thank you so much. And until next time, take care. Bye. Bye. See ya.